everybody. Oh, here's my chair. Hi, thanks everybody for coming here. This is the all-female showrunners panel, or as we can call it, a showrunners panel. Um, I am so privileged to have been asked to moderate this. I hear that um, this was submitted to San Diego Comic-Con as a panel, and it was rejected. I'm not sure whose uh, figurine collection got a panel instead of this one. <laughs> But I think that we are going to have an even better event now, open to a lot more people, so it actually turned out uh, for the good. So thank you, YouTube. This is going to be an awesome evening of enlightenment and, ins and insight and into an um, amazing group of women's creative process. And the word vagina is probably going to be said more than once. I'm just going to let you know. I, j I did it once, so it's already one. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, one by one, and we're going to please give them applause when they come out because un unless you do that, it's going to be a real awkward walk out. <laughs> I've had that happen to me. It's not good. Uh, first, uh, a panelist I know and love and have worked with. Um, I didn't put her in first, but she uh, is first in my book. Huh. Uh, uh, Amy Berg. She worked on Counterpart, Da Vinci's Demons, Person of Interest, Alias, Eureka. Amy Berg, sit next to me. Vagina! <laughs> Our next panelist uh, is Monica Owusu Breen. She works on amazing shows like Midnight Texas, Brothers and Sisters, Aces of S.H.I.E.L.D., etc. Another amazing woman I have the privilege of working with. Uh, you know, I'm not plug. I love you too. One day we'll work together. I'm not begging. Um, it's Sarah Gamble. She created many shows. Uh, you, The Magicians, Aquarius, and Supernatural. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, next is Gillian Horvath. She uh, worked on Primeval, New World, Beauty and the Beast, Sanctuary, and Highlander. Yeah. She worked with a lot of broadswords. I like that. Next is Lauren LaFranc. She has a show called Impulse. Worked on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Hemlock Grove, and Chuck. Hi, Lauren. Uh, next is Kimberly Jessica. Founder, she's worked on things like Founder Kid Pyre TV, Triune, Princess Tyler Marie, Fairy Tale Chronicles. Hi. And last but definitely not least, and the star, pants star of the show, and you'll see what I'm talking about when she comes out, <laughs> Willow Polson. She worked on Triune, Vinci's America with Ginger, Manos the Debbie Chronicles. Hi, Willow. Right? Pants star of the evening. You guys, this is an amazing lineup, and I want to throw it out to you guys, um, the first question, which is, well, just let's start with the basics. Uh, if we go down the line, I'm awkwardly in the middle, so uh, you could skip me. Uh, how did you guys get in the business, and did you know what you were getting into when uh, you became a showrunner? Did you know, have any idea uh, of the path that you would have and what you were getting into? Hi, Willow. <laughs> oh, God, it's me. Um, no, wait. Uh, <laughs> how, yeah, how'd your, path, how, how'd your path go, and did you know what you were getting into? I wasn't sure what I was getting into. Um, I just wanted to make great stuff for people to enjoy and make the world a better place. And... I, it started out with my friend Ginger Polly, who is in the audience. There she is, Ginger. Shout the out to girl. Ginger. And, nice, um, nice pants, again, nice pants. <laughs> yeah, right? It's the pants. It's a pants thing. Um, and she wanted to do a show about uh, vintage stuff and uh, what, vintage, what vintage was, what vintage is today. And I said, well, why can't we? Why can't we do that? And I just started following my nose and doing it. And I had a history of uh, um, live events management. And I, it just translated really well. And um, with Ginger's help and, and my crew's help, um, I, it, it just kind of happened. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> uh, hello, guys. Um, for me, I've been working in TV for like 11 years or so before I had this opportunity. And I just got to run my first show called Impulse. And um, I felt ready for that. At the same time, I had no idea what I was getting into, because it. and I was told by many friends who've sure run before, Monica included, that your life is suddenly not your own and you have to make decisions time and again and you're multitasking 
like a mofo. Uh, and then I found out at the same time as I got my first show that I was pregnant. So I was like, oh, cool. Um, <laughs> that's great timing. I can't wait to do all of this at once. Um, but it kind of kept me in check. And so I don't know how to run a show without being pregnant. So if we get a second season, uh, I'm going to have to figure some stuff out. Um. I did not know what I was getting into. I kind of just was putting off writing a dissertation with a really close friend of mine who was also writing a dissertation. And so we write it, wrote spec scripts to sort of procrastinate. And then um, <laughs> we got jobs. And then, and had I known how challenging it would be, I don't, I probably still would do it, but I had no idea. Um, and. I always thought running a show would be like, and then I get to tell every story I want. Um, and I realize it's really middle management a little bit. Um, and it's harder than I ever could have imagined. In certain ways, more fun. Certain ways. Uh, I was writing specs with a friend also and was advised that one way to get agents to look at your material is to submit it to uh, you know, any kind of contests, anything, just anything that would make an assistant crack it open, which is how I ended up on reality TV. <laughs> um, uh, because we submitted to Project Greenlight and made the finals. And that was enough for me to be able to cold call every agency in Los Angeles. So that's kind of how I started. And as soon as I wrapped my head around the idea of writing TV, I knew I wanted to be a creator. I knew I wanted to make shows that were um, from somewhere inside of me and to work with people on bringing those to life. And then I spent a good five or six years climbing the ladder as a staff writer. Um, it took a little longer than I expected, but I have to say it was so valuable. <laughs> um, I thank God every day that it, I slowed my role to becoming a showrunner because everything that they're saying is true. There's no way to prepare for that amount of work. Um, so take advantage, I think, of opportunities to learn from other people. Uh, I was an undeclared major in college, so I <laughs> really uh, had no clue where I was going to end up. And uh, I was fortunate to have a professor uh, pull me aside uh, one day after I had written this dumb paper exploring the, the character motivations in Hamlet, some bullshit like English <laughs> professor's assignment that they give you. And uh, I, I was bored, and so I decided to frame it as though I was a uh, theater director giving directions to the actors. Um, and so she pulled me aside, and she was like, uh, I don't know how to say this, but you don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, uh, where do, a uh, mental institution? Uh, she said, no, film school. Uh, and so I, I transferred um, a few weeks later and ended up in film school and then um, moved to L.A. not knowing a single person. My roommate was getting her master's degree in social work. Super helpful. Um, and uh, I, I just I got a job. I just got a job as an assistant uh, and I worked my butt off and um, uh, I, I got lucky and uh, our order was extended and, uh, and I was just like, hey, I got ideas. You need ideas? I got ideas. <laughs> Um, and, and like Sarah, I've just sort of been like a ground gamer. I've been like, I've been working in TV um, since I moved to town in 1998. So it's, it's, I've been here a while doing it. Um, and fortunately, um, I was lucky enough to create a show with Felicia uh, called uh, Caper a few years ago. And, uh, and then from that, I've, I've just been running shows and uh, people have been hiring me finally to be the boss instead of the, uh, the woman behind the boss. Yeah, Lian? Uh, I'm another tortoise in this business of tortoises and hares that, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I had internships in college at a couple of the studios, and then I came out and worked as a researcher and an assistant, and then m worked my way up the ladder of uh, staff writing uh, until it was, you know, until I reached the point where I could actually uh, takeover shows. That seems to be my trademark. I have not yet sold a show that I created. Um, I get brought in on projects that are being launched because of the experience I have. And I really, uh, I'm I, like Sarah, I'm grateful for the time that I spent working my way up because I think it 
that left me with a level of expertise that people feel confident putting things in my hand because I've I've seen a lot of a, what insurance company are those commercials for where it's like you know we cover it because we've seen it all that's <laughs> like there's there's not that much that crosses in front of you when you've been doing this for like 18 20 years that you're like oh yeah I've seen this before and I actually can handle it <laughs> Hello, everyone. I came from a background of being a special education teacher and creating content in school systems that the kids were considered failures, special, um, never amount to anything, can't pass tests. So I was tasked with the job of creating tests as well as creating curriculum for those kids to be able to make it out of high school. And I chose to highlight those kids uh, gifts instead of focusing on what numbers they can't do in math. So having uh, gotten a master's degree in that, I started creating content for children. And I was very ignorant to the industry because I thought, well, you know, I'll just create this script and write this little storybook and uh, somebody will want to buy it. And that simply was not the case. It's a very, <laughs> you know, political environment. And so I went ahead and I said, you know what, I'm going to create my own content and I'm going to go ahead and create an animated TV network that is for special ed kids across the world, multicultural kids across the world, and creating characters and content that they can relate to. And so I created Kid Pyre TV Network, and I went from trying to sell my content to becoming an aggregator and a place where uh, creators can now have a space where their content in animation can be shown. And I was able to partner with uh, TV networks and other influencers, and now I have a streaming animated TV network, and it's also on cable TV. It's so amazing. That's how it's I Amazing. It's a great story. I want to come back to that independent content because we're definitely in a world where um, it does. It's there's so many ways to get there. But I, I think in everybody's journey, there's so much fight in everybody's voices. <laughs> I mean, so much fight. And I like, uh, you know, just opening it up. We don't have to go in line because I know it gets awkward, especially some in the middle. Um, what, how, I mean, what is it about show running that is so challenging and, and you didn't expect when you got there that you now have, skill, have to have skills to carry you through that you didn't know? Because everyone says, okay, you're a creator. You create something and you create and what else do you do as a showrunner that people don't maybe not appreciate about showrunning? I think, I think the assumption people have is that it just means you're boss writer. And that's not the case at all. Because <laughs> writing is, is probably, you know, 20% of what being a showrunner is. The other, uh, I, don't, I don't math, but it's probably, it's probably it's around 85. Um, mm, that doesn't work, no, Amy, no. sorry. Um, you good writer. <laughs> you good writer. Um, but the other the other eighty percent is um, is people managing and and being a you know and being someone whose job it is to answer a question every five seconds because that's your job your job is stuff is put in front of you and you're like oh oh that's a prop okay that one um, and but you have to do it with a little more uh, confidence that even one. though you don't have it um, <laughs> you just say yeah that one I, not that one. But you have no idea. Um, it, yeah, there is there is an element of sort of showmanship in the job that I certainly did not expect. Um, uh, I really just thought I was going to write scripts and and be done with it. But um, but there is a whole other level to it that is um, both exciting and scary. When um, when my writing partner and I for, got our first um, show running job on Brothers and Sisters, which we had worked on for a year, our first trip was to Barnes and Noble because there were bookstores back then and we um, <laughs> bought these books like how to handle difficult people yeah. <laughs> um, nice girls don't get the corner office like it was like amazing totally the library right I'm I know <laughs> and then it turns out that's not me and that nice girl don't like there were just these tricks that I was just like oh right that feels weird yeah. <laughs> like it's and it's funny to think you have to put on this manager outfit but finding that manager person in you that feels organic to you and isn't you imitating the many bosses you've had um, okay. it's a weird thing it's a sort of a strange outfit for someone who just really wants to sit at home and write in their pajamas <laughs> and tell stories in their head to be like oh I have to ask people to do things don't get me wrong I still wear my pajamas <laughs> so as the boss you can do that the, the hardest thing for me 
was uh, you, as a, as a writer coming up in the ranks, you know who you're trying to please. You're trying to please the showrunner. And if you come up with ideas that the showrunner likes, or you write scripts that the showrunner doesn't need to fix, you're the hero. And you get lots of gold stars for like, thanks for saving the day, kid. Great having you on board. And then when you're in that big chair, there's like nobody giving you a gold star. <laughs> The network does not hand them out. <laughs> and so that, you know, that can be Only really, red checks. Only yeah, checks. that's right. And that can be really hard. And you, you have to get accustomed to not everyone even liking you anymore. I mean, <laughs> sometimes you have to tell people that what they gave you isn't what you wanted. And they, they might stalk off to their office thinking you are an idiot but you you can't let that get under your skin, and that was the hardest thing for me. It still is, honestly. I like to be liked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think I agree with everything these women have said, and I, I think it's the most intensive multitasking you'll ever do in your life. And you do have to make decisions, and you can't look back, and you just have to own it. And and if you're not confident, act confident. And if it's a mistake down the road, then you learn from it and you keep going. And I think it's also in, in terms of how to learn how to manage people, it's also how to mentor and how to make other people feel like they can create something and are a part of this and it's as much theirs as it is yours and create that kind of an environment that's positive. And then also, you know, you're in a power position all of a sudden and it's about giving back to in, in my mind and finding, like empowering other people who, you know, make your room more diverse, um, fill it with people who are from different places, uh, more women than men maybe, because, you know, for me, I was maybe one or one of two women in a writer's room my whole career. And this was the first show, the one that I've just ran with more women in the writer's room than men. And I had seven out of the 10 female or directors be female, whereas before I've worked with one woman personally, of all the shows uh, I've written on, which is crazy. So I, I think it's hard to try to be a good person and to be a model and to not lose your mind while you're making decisions and trying to manage stress. And I think that uh, all-encompassing job is what makes it so crazy. Yeah, I mean, Sarah, you're doing two shows at the same time, which I'm always, always amazed. I worked up to it, though. Uh, you worked up to it. <laughs> This, that was not my first season show running, was yeah. two shows at the same time. That's no. incredible still, too. Because, and, and what do you guys think? I mean, obviously, this is the all-female show runners panel, and I'm hearing a little bit of stories in some of the things that you're saying, Lauren, but also, uh, Gillian, you, uh, you were a champion at sort of pleasing the boss, in a sense. And that seems to be, for me at least, something I find common in myself, but also a lot of women. You know, we're very good at accommodating, and there are certain things that we're raised to kind of think as women. Do you find any of those skills um, hindered you or, and, or helped you along the way? And is there something specific about being a woman uh, showrunner that you think is special that you bring to the job? Hmm. Or unique or something? I'll just keep filling until no, someone well, gets <laughs> it's, I, I, I find it so interesting what you're saying because when you're on a staff up to when you're what we call the number two, which is the most senior writer and producer underneath the showrunner, your job is really a yes and kind of job where you just keep throwing spaghetti at the wall and you just keep trying to solve the problem. And then as soon as you become a showrunner, especially, I mean, my experience was that I was promoted into the job in season six of an existing show. Um, suddenly you go from yes and, yes and, yes and to no, 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 no. <laughs> and it's just, a, it's, a, it's an adjustment. And it may be that it was more of an adjustment for me because as a woman, yeah. I probably was um, saying no as politely as possible often not using the word no in my younger life. So I actually think this is probably one of the most helpful things in my personal development, that nobody has time for me to use 25 words when what I wanna say is no hat. Like the, the actor cannot wear a hat in this scene. Or no, we're not doing a mafia story in episode six. It's because no is a way for them to say like, okay, we're, we're pushing that away and we can focus on something else. Like everybody just wants to do their job well. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really what you learn your job is when you're a showrunner. It's not to dictate the story. It's not to dictate the shots to the director. It's to empower people to do their job really, really well. And the way that we do it is by clearing away everything that's not the show. So I think more than anything else, the heart of the job, I don't remember what your question is anymore, but this is the question <laughs> I asked. No, keep going. Keep going. The keep heart going. of the job is like we are holding that weird, tiny, beating heart of the story, uh -huh. whatever that is. Someone has to, and it's the showrunner. 
And um, so we're able to say yes, no, yes, no. We're also able to know, because it is a fight, every, I mean, I like the fight, but it is a fight every day with the studio and network. They have ideas and opinions and they want to keep the cost down. And, and so every day, a million times a day, I'm sort of checking in with like the weird beating heart of the show going, can I afford to let this go? Can we afford to let that go? Can we tell that one? And every now and again, the answer to that is no. And then I know what I need to fight for, what the bottom line is. So that's interesting because you're talking about removing your ego from the process and the creativity in order to protect the the, the seed that is your the ch almost a child of your. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't want to say I don't ha not having human children. I yeah. hear they're more valuable and important than yeah, children. They're, they're, very, they're very breakable <laughs> and very annoying a lot. But there is a sort of empowered empowerment in that I'm do I'm fighting for this person versus myself because I think it's hard for women to do so, and not I'm generalizing, but it's harder for us because we're kind of taught from birth that we need to put other people first in a sense and care for others before ourselves. And I think that's really interesting what you're saying because it kind of reflects the process of how do I be a boss but also protect this show um, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, having been a number two on many, many shows to always a man, uh, I, I know exactly the trap you fall, you fall into, which is sort of like, you know, you become sort of like the nurturing supporter. Um, you become the backbone of the dude, you know, and um, breaking through that to, to be your own boss is... is um, uh, liberating as fuck, um, <clears throat> but but also I mean it's there's like a learning curve too because like you know at 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 some point you're the one that has to sort of like you know it's not my job to support my job is to lead and it is it is a difference and and you have to sort of like you know literally take off a hat and put it back on even though Sarah doesn't want it um, uh, and, and yeah no hat. Um, but but it but it's a, it's a learning curve that I that I found that I that I needed to endure um, uh, when I when I made the leap. Gillian, you were gonna say something? Yeah, there certainly are these studies that say that women uh, prefer to lead by consensus, and uh, whether it's true of all women or not, it certainly applies to me. Uh, a mentor of mine who happens to be uh, male gave me some words of wisdom. Uh, he said to me, he said, you are very rational, you expect other people to be rational, and you lay out the whole argument thinking that once you've laid the whole thing out, everyone will agree with your conclusion, but you actually don't care. You don't need them to agree with you. You don't need to spend all that time laying out the whole argument. Just put your conclusion on the table. If, if people are willing to move forward with that, for reasons that differ from your reasons, that's fine. Let's just go with this. We don't have to agree on why. And if not, then you, you, know, then you can get into the persuasion part. But I do spend, tend to spend a lot of time persuading people when the fact is once you're the showrunner, a lot of times you can just say what you need and stop talking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm completely self-taught, actually. Um, so I'm not coming from a place of having worked for a bunch of dudes, it's just been me, yay. But also it's been yeah. like really hard because I don't have the, the opportunities that working in a network system will give you. Um, so it's been, I mean, thank God for the digital space, like YouTube and like the Kimberly Jessica's uh, uh, network that I, one of my shows is going to be on actually, um, that, that it opens up a whole new opportunity for women because we're not having to fight our way up through the male verse, sorry guys, but it's a thing. And, and that's, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm self, kind of self-created in that way, in that, um, like I say, I came up from, from just doing live events and going, yeah, why can't I make a show? How naive of me. But it's worked, it's actually worked, it's won an award. And um, so that's the, the type of thing that you guys can do now, believe it or not, oh my God, you can do a show, put it on the internet, be an influencer like the people sitting in this room right now, and that's a whole different situation than we had you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, so. And it's interesting, uh, how, can you guys speak to, we, we talk, and again, I, I always, every time I talk to showrunners, it, they're t they're, everything always gravitates toward having to manage people and being in charge and making decisions. But can we talk a little bit about that creativity aspect and 
uh, you know, how do you get the best creative uh, ideas out of the people that you're having to be the boss of? Like, can we, and how do you have that, how do you translate that unifying sort of creative vision to people in a way that makes them excited versus like, oh God, I hate that person. <laughs> right. What, one of the things for me is I had to get used to hearing no. And just because you hear no does not mean never. It doesn't mean that you'll ev never, ever get what you want or where you want to be. What you have to be comfortable with is hearing no, and you have to be comfortable in your project and knowing, when you have that inner knowing that you know you have a good project and your project is filling a void, my project is filling a void. There is a void there for women in animation, for multicultural animated TV network and content that can speak to kids that look like me, not only look like me, I'm from Panama, so my first language is Spanish, and I'm an immigrant. So I created a network in English and in Spanish to let these kids know that there are other Wonder Women, there are other kick-ass Buffy the Vampire Slayers, and looking for other people that have that kind of content that you can put on your network, because at that point, it's no longer about you. That's my message mm -hmm. to that. <laughs> so the, the creativity part is the fun part. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that when you're in production on a TV show, it's sort of like there's a constant timer. You never have enough time. You never have enough money. I, you get phone calls saying, We're th this is three days too long. Cut three days worth of material out of your script. <laughs> but when you're in the writer's room, that's like a sacred place where the best idea wins, at least to start with. So my trick, at least every writer's room kind of has its own character. Some are more serious. Some tell more stories from therapy. Um, <laughs> but I want to um, I want to make sure it's a safe space for whatever this weird kind of synchronicity of these people coming together is. And for the magicians, which is currently in production, um, we have a lot of toys in the writers' room. We have um, a, a hoodie, like a fleece hoodie that has a unicorn head on it. <laughs> that people wear to pitch ideas. <laughs> we have an assortment of trophies that are given out when, you know, first prize in giving zero fucks is one of them. I'm um, getting so many ideas right you now. Know, like, <laughs> we have one that's called the Unicorn of Awesome, you know, we have a special one for when pitches, when someone can't let go of a pitch and they finally get it through. <laughs> there's, a, there's an award. And, and the, it seems a little silly, and yes, we're bored, and we see each other for so many hours a day, but there is a little bit of a method to the madness, which is that, Producing a show is an adult job that, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent making these shows, but creating television is like a child's job. It's for the kid inside of you. So we lure them out with candy and toys every day. It's amazing. The talking stick is a unicorn stick. It is. Oh, it's I literally a unicorn so much. stick. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's like playing make-believe, and that's what I always, and then someone builds your fort. Um, and it's so fun, and I think when you lose sight of how fun it is, then something's wrong. Um, and I, you know, I've been fortunate enough in the rooms that I've been in, predominantly, some mixed bags out there, but predominantly, I've had a lot of really good, positive environments, and it makes a huge difference, not only in your life, but creatively what you can do. If you work for someone who wants you to have a fully formed pitch every time you open your mouth, or doesn't give you the opportunity to like say something kind of stupid, and like we can all laugh about it and move on and make it a safe creative space, then I don't think you're gonna get great ideas out of people. Um, and I, I think, you know, in terms of show running and as a woman, I, I do think it's about also figuring out your voice, like not only your creative voice, which is extremely important, and I think we all as writers spend a lot of time doing again and again, but also your voices as a manager, as a person, and who you'd want to work for. Um, and to tell people, you know, I've told writers, they didn't believe me initially because it depends on the environments they've been in. But I'm like, please disagree with me. I am bored with listening to myself speak. I am not, like, I, I have every right by the end of the day, like, if we are, do, you know, have a lot of discourse, to ultimately decide what we're doing. That's my job. You have to make that decision. But tell me if you think you don't love that, T talk to me about it. Like, that's what a room is for. That's why we're not, you know, sitting by ourselves in front of a computer all the time. That's why TV is so great, is because it's a collaborative space. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think in TV, like, you have to, um, 
you, you can fall really quickly into the habit of episodic of, of like, because you, you know, there's a train and you know, you have to get, you have to write the next script so we can shoot it. Um, but I think you, as soon as you sort of, the, you, you hear the start hearing the train, you get, you get messed up and, and creatively you're, you're now focused on the timing and having to get a thing done rather than the broad sort of brainstorming, which is the fun part. So like the, the trick I use aside from, um, you know, toys and, and candy, which I also use, um, <laughs> Is, is when we first get started, like, forget episodes. Forget how many episodes we have, forget scripts, forget all of that. What do we want to make? What are, what's going to be fun for us to, to you know, like what, what is, like, what can we dream up? Um, and I think sometimes we, we forget that side of it, um, which is for me, like, why I love the room and love being in the room is just sort of like, this could go anywhere what feels great right now, you know? And, and, uh, and just sort of like ignoring the, the episodes that you have to get done for at least a time. I, I think people tend to replicate the kind of room they were brought up in, which is some rooms I think are toxic because the person in charge of them started out in a toxic room and they just don't know another way to do it. I was very lucky. My very first uh, gig lasted for four years and was with one of the best showrunners in town. I worked on Highlander the series, seasons two through five. And I was there for four years, and we always knew we were coming back before we went on hiatus. So there was this level of confidence of like, we know we're doing this. And we, because it was syndication, not network, we didn't have the specter of cancellation hanging over us. Once we got renewed, we were definitely making 22 episodes, which is a lot of episodes. And so there was that freedom of like, we could make, big plans without hearing the train rumbling down on us. And the other advantage of a first-run syndication show, which is where I started my career, uh, was small staffs. There are not a lot of people, so everyone, including the most junior person, which at the time was me, felt like it actually mattered what they said and what they wrote. When you have a huge staff, it can be, it can be hard to stay engaged in a project if you feel like nothing you suggest is ever picked up or that nothing you have to offer is unique or adds to the mix. So making sure that everybody feels heard and like it matters that they're there is gonna bring out the best in people, I think. I, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the negatives because um, I think we all are interested to see, kind of as a woman, are there things that you've seen, roadblocks, uh, particular things you've had to overcome or deal with or dance around knowing that you're a woman. Um, I mean, Lauren, you're talking about this, this, your writing room is the only one that's been a majority women ever in your life. It's, I mean, it's crazy, but it's actually true in most of the industry. And, you know, I, I can't even remember, I screamed at one of my managers in the past because they're like, well, you know, it's really hard for a white guy in animation right now. And I'm like, you shut it. <laughs> I was so angry. I was like, don't you, I literally was like, so mean. I was like, don't you ever come, have that come out of your mouth again. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You're propagating a myth that is basically creating more resentment against women amongst men in this industry and making them less likely to hire them. Oh, I ripped him a butthole. <laughs> but you hear that a lot, actually. And, you know, just as a woman, you know, you, you kind of, you're working in a man's world. I mean, there's obviously a lot of breakthrough, but it's recent. And can you talk to any anecdotes or history or just observations, uh, recommendations for women in this business having to kind of dance around that kind of stuff? For me as an independent, it's been money and it's been uh, representatives, reps, uh, agents and managers. Most investors are men and they tend to invest in man things. <laughs> And uh, it, it, it doesn't really filter down to us that as much. Uh, there's very, very few uh, female investors that are angel investors or any kind of, any kind of investors. So that's been a, a really big hurdle is that um, I worked for a company for a while that, <laughs> I, I'm not gonna say it too much, but just they, they make dude films and they make the same film, but with different dudes. And it's just <laughs> over and over and over. Dude and films. It's, it's, <laughs> May as well be the name of the company. Um, it, yeah, and it's never changing. But um, hopefully uh, people will realize the value of women's stories told by women, ideally. That would be great. Uh, and then also uh, agents and managers. Um, 
I've heard stories about uh, people that purposefully put male names on uh, uh, query letters, and they get a whole lot more interest than if they put a female name on a query letter. And that's just the sad reality. It's like an orchestra used to be mostly men until they started doing blind auditions, and now it's about 50-50, huh? So, yeah, and that's a thing. That's a real thing. And, and uh, so it, it's those two things are huge hurdles, especially for the independents like me and Kimberly Jessica. I, I was totally, like you said, I was, I was completely ignorant to it. I just thought that here I am, I'm here to fill, fill a void that, you know, is not necessarily, you know, being represented. And I thought that, yay, I'll get, you know, I'll get picked up, I'll get represented, I'll get an agent, I'll get funding. No, that did not happen. <laughs> and um, it was, I was in utter shock. And this is no hate speech towards men, because trust me, I love men. You know? <laughs> no hate speech. Because, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of times I've, I've heard guys say, oh, you're one of those women hating, men hating. It's not, that's not the case. I'm just speaking on the reality of what the what so. And when I went to an event, it was the licensing expo, and all these amazing animations and just amazing creative properties were out there in every booth I went to. I was utter, in utter shock that it was all men that was creating the content and they all looked the same. And there was no space for me or, and, or there was no space for women. And so I feel that they're, they're definitely, I'm hoping for a change and I'm hoping to be a catalyst of that change in the animation space. So yeah, that's one of the negativisms that I've experienced. You know, for my own sanity, I, re I really never thought about it when I was coming up. I was the only woman in the writer's room most of the time, but I also never expected this to be easy. I mean, I'm, I'm much more privileged than many. I'm less privileged than some who are now complaining to your representatives. <laughs> it's like a little harder for them. But so I'm not like the very top, easiest echelon okay, right? Um, all of these sort of systemic injustices that we're working on are important to work on, and we should spend and devote some of our time to working on it, but if what you really want to do is make a certain kind of art, then do what you have to do to squeeze yourself in there, right? Just most of my energy just went to, I want to be a showrunner, how do I create a TV show? And I just pushed, and I didn't expend any energy thinking about whether setbacks were gendered. I just didn't. I mean, I've been, I've been thinking about it a little bit more lately because Me Too is like trending and having a vagina is very trendy in 2018. Um, I didn't think vagina about it. Vagina two, two vaginas. Just, I'm sorry, I'm keeping Okay. That. Should we also we say go. pussy? I don't know, anyway. I like um, it. <laughs> but the other thing that I think about a lot is that, yeah, the world is incredibly unfair and, and it's, it's, um, it's unfair based on your gender. It is unfair based on the color of your skin. It's unfair based on how, uh, based on whether you're, or not you are able in your body. There's a lot of things that are unfair, but those things that are challenges or those things that make life more unfair to you are also where art comes from. And I wouldn't trade a little extra, get in, get a little higher budget, get in with a couple more people, whatever that is. I wouldn't trade it for my voice. I wouldn't, Trade it. Those people are boring. They're just boring. We've heard that. We've heard those stories. Like I want to. I want to make something interesting. And so, because I can't separate being a woman from the rest of the package for what I want to do for the art and the craft that I want to make, I don't spend much time thinking about that. Yeah, it's um, it's funny because for a lot of my career, especially when I was with my writing partner, we'd write genre. And so we'd go meet on jobs, and I'd see friends. I'm like, you're here for the woman job, right? <laughs> like, we're the women in the male room. And we'd all sort of sit there, sort of awkwardly, like, realizing, oh, they're only interviewing one of us because, you know, cars and guns, <laughs> I guess. I, don't, I never quite figured it out. And it's interesting because I feel like at a part I'm at the place in my career where I don't go meet on the woman job anymore because I'm kind of out. Like, because I know I kind of don't thrive in places where there's only room for one person like me. Because no matter what, I'm trying to sort of reach, I'm trying to not be me because me isn't good enough to have more of me in the room, apparently. Um, but it's weird because I do feel like it's changing. I don't feel like it's this, at least it's not as naked 
as I'm only hiring one woman, give me mid-level women. I don't feel like people are as comfortable to nakedly say that, nor are agents as comfortable to say, look, they're only interviewing one woman. Because that sounds horrifying right now. And I feel like finally we're accepting that that's a weird thing to say. Or to say, you'd be great on that show, but they don't hire women. Oh no, I, was, I, I know a lot of people, women writers from 10 years ago when I first moved here, and then agents would pair their white male writers with, with someone of, you know, a woman or uh, somebody of ethnicity because they're like, oh, there's that one slot. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy when you think like, oh, that's a way to get in, but why? Why only have one slot? Why? That's you not true. I mean, that's not true on any of our shows. No. Yeah, that yeah. Were, like of Most course, no, of no, the no. Mo writer's room for you, the other show I did was primarily female, and it's, mm -hmm. it's at least 50-50. I think that's, uh, that's how it changes, is giving, if you give anyone opportunity who is in the minority, who doesn't often get opportunity, they tend to be like, wait a minute, I don't like the way that this has been going, like, I'd like some more diversity, please. I mean, for me too, it's not just about having women, it's about having different voices and people with different life experiences. So we're not all, you know, I've been in rooms where and I love these guys, but they all have like the same band that they love. And like, let's go to this concert together. And I'm like, is it fish? Cool, but it's fish. It's it? fish. It's always fish, which is super weird. Um, and I'm like, what's fish? Um, but they bond because they're like the same generation. They've had similar upbringings. Like I've just, they dress similarly and we make jokes about it. Um, and it's, and you know, it's fun at, at times, but you're like, this is a problem because we, we have a cast that is not you. They don't look like you. So that doesn't feel representative. Um, you know, and in, in terms of being a woman in the industry and some of the hurdles, I think it is hard for any of us who've been in a room where everyone's like, there's a female character. What uh, do women do? And you're like, well, I'm one person. I have a perspective. I also have opinions about the male characters too. Um, and having been pregnant this last go around, I think, unfortunately, in our industry, and we are pretty behind on it, my first instinct when I found out I was pregnant was, oh, shit. Because I'm like, I just was given this opportunity, and I'm, of course, I'm like a female showrunner, and now they're going to be like, she got pregnant. We hired a pregnant lady. And th that shouldn't be the first feeling. The first feeling <laughs> I should have is, this is so exciting. Um, and, and I, you know, to everyone's credit, you know, it should be the standard. No one bat an eye and everyone was very supportive and timing wise it worked out well where the last day of shooting, I literally gave birth. Um, so like just by happenstance, not planned, That's thank God. magical. It was amazing. My body was like, get out of here. Um, we're done. We're finished. But, um, but women shouldn't have to fear that. And, and I think they do because a lot of the time our, our industry has not been very helpful to combating that and I think women are looked at like oh could she get pregnant should I hire her and we got to fix that yeah I actually wrote a pilot last year for I was hired to write a pilot as a writer and I got pregnant and I didn't tell them until like three weeks before and I'm not going to name the person famously bad person uh he was like what the f we're very happy for you <laughs> not even kidding it was the best phone call ever <laughs> I was like Jillian you're saying Gillian. Gillian. God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm tired. Story of my life. No, I know so good up until now. You were. You absolutely were. Um, as, uh, as a woman who writes action and actually like competitively shoots guns, I was the beneficiary of that system of like, we need a woman in here who gets along with guys. Like I, I definitely got a lot of those jobs of we need one woman on this, on this guy flavored show. Um, and that... <laughs> Um, but I, I really am seeing a shift. I mean, the last couple of shows I've been on have been more like a 50-50 split, and that's great. I mean, one of them I was staffing it, so I was responsible for it. But even when I'm not in charge, I see more, more of that. The, the last remaining prejudice that's getting on my last nerve is that they expect women to write women exclusively, that my agent is calling me frequently to say they want a show with a female lead, so they want to hear from you. I would love, I mean, hey, I, I, I like writing women, but I also like writing male leads. I mean, I mentioned I spent four years on Highlander the series. That is like a very masculine character, <laughs> and I was happy to write him. I, uh, I went on to Baywatch one year, 
and they actually said to me, we have a bunch of new characters, we have a bunch of new female characters coming in, so we want you to shepherd the voices of those characters, but it's not what wound up happening because it turns out straight guys are more interested in writing women, and as a straight woman, I was really more interested in focusing on the male lifeguards. <laughs> so it was a little equal opportunity objectification going on. <laughs> and so I actually wound up having fun on that show, but the, the stated purpose of like, as the woman, you're here to shepherd the women is like, I don't know, I'm kind of fascinated with people who may or may not be women. When I, when I broke in, it was, uh... A little easier for me, I think, because I'm a, a huge tomboy and I, and I love sports. And it was sort of like a way into a conversation with male showrunners that uh, I think um, a lot of women and possibly gay men don't have access to in their brains. Um, and uh, I mean, they got over it really fast when I beat them all at fantasy football. Um, but uh, but um, but it, that was sort of the door. But I've the the issues I've been encountering is um, when there is a a conflict um, once you already have the job. Mm -hmm. And what I've encountered is that um, the people that do the hiring and make the decisions um, often side with um, the narcissist um, because they're afraid of them when it's a he said, she said situation. Um, and so there have been times where I've been sort of caught um, in the, you know, I'm, I'm the one they're not worried about bitching um, and, and complaining to their managers and going to the press. I'm, not, I'm the one they're not worried about. So they're gonna side with the other guy. Um, I've encountered that a lot. Um, and I've been backstabbed a lot. And I think as a woman, it's sort of, there's an expectation that we're, we're better at taking it because it's harder for us already, um, which is frustrating as hell um, because, you know, if you've been stabbed enough times, like, that adds up. That really adds up. Uh, and it, it wears you down. And it, and it doesn't matter how resilient you become um, uh, because at the end of the day, if you're the one with the soul, um, you're still gonna, you're still gonna feel it more, the most, you know? So... Um, I, that's what I've encountered. Um, there's a, a lot of people are talking about diversity and the kind of stories that we're seeing a lot lately. And I think it's kind of a function of the glut of television right now. I mean, I was at a party and this guy had a hand cream company and then he's like, yeah, we're getting into television. I'm like, why? <laughs> Who are you? Did you get his card? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, but it's like everybody and their uncle's like getting into TV, quote unquote. And I'm like, how, this could be a good thing, because, but I would like to see you guys' perspectives on how that's changing the landscape of creation and selling. Um, and how do you think that impact is going to be long term on your own careers as well? Because a lot of you guys have worked mostly in network. Like, have you worked on a streaming platform? Is it different? Like, please talk about that while I get my notes. I love what's happening right now. I fear it's a little bit of a bubble, like the housing bubble in Los Angeles. It will <laughs> burst a little. Um, but because there is so much more, there are so many more platforms, and probably one was born as we spoke these words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the way that they make money is not the same as it used to be, so you don't have to have that like four quadrant hit. Um, I work for places like the Sci-Fi Network with magicians and Lifetime um, Television for Women, whatever. Um, with uh, I, I just uh, finished a show called You that will premiere in September, which is I think their first male lit lead actually. Um, but what they are focused on is very granular. Their idea of success is different than NBC's idea of success, and why that benefits us uh, strange, weird, creative types is that um, our ideas are usually a little quirkier than what ends up on network TV. Um, and so the version that we have in our head that doesn't appeal to like the house MD audience, we used to have to move it towards the center. And now there are thousands of, it feels like hundreds of places that are like, bring us your weirdest thing, right? Um, so for as long as it lasts, I'm very, very happy and excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I work uh, almost exclusively in the, uh, the pay cable and streaming space now. And, um, and I love it. Um, 
especially because of the specificity, because that's how I like to write. I don't want to write a four quadrant show. Like, I don't want to write for, um, you know, like a CBS audience. I, 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 you know, I want to, I want my characters to have a very, very specific voice. Um, and that means the show is going to be very, very specific and almost targeted um, to a certain audience. And that's why I love the pay cable and, and uh, streaming space, especially right now, because you're right. It's like, oh, you have a very like quirky, weird thing? That's what they want to hear right now. And it's so, it's so exciting to be alive uh, <laughs> in, in, in a time like this, especially um, as a woman, because I feel like now we're, we're, we're you know, getting the opportunities to get in the door um, to pitch things um, that are outside the box. That we're, we're kind of reserved for men for a while. And it's amazing how, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm I was going to say, I call it the Wild West. It's just kind of, it's the, the land grab. It's, it, nobody knows how it's going to end. <laughs> um, I, I think there's going to be probably, I don't even want to give it a percentage, but there's going to be, uh, you know, some, some will succeed, some will fail. We'll all find out together. <laughs> Kimberly, you, I mean, you have a unique story in that you're trying to create a, a digital platform yourself. And how do you, do you notice that recently there's been, it's been easier to be able to get access to people with funding in that way? Or how do you feel the digital space is right now? Um, it still is not easy. What I have found um, working for me is reaching out to people that have their own television networks on cable TV and partnering with them. Because even with funding, they still want to see your numbers. And if your numbers aren't over a million, especially with funding or even getting representatives or even getting you know, licensing, it's what we call impossible. It's impossible. <laughs> um, so you, I, I suggest that you reach out, you know, get really non-traditional and grassrootsy, but non-traditional. Don't be afraid to reach out to influencers. Don't be afraid to, you know, look up what new TV networks are on Antenna TV that are looking for content or c smaller cable TV networks. All those numbers, when you join with those people, can add to your numbers in your press kit. And when your numbers in your press kit look like my numbers right now, <laughs> That's when you start cracking doors open because my, my, my goal is to go mainstream. I want this to be mainstream. I want this to be like a, you know, not like a, but like, you know, a, a cartoon network, a Nickelodeon. And so you got to have those numbers and those logos and also getting the right kind of press is very important. After we got written up in Forbes, we, a lot of like major agents, we didn't get picked up, but just for the fact that they reached out to us was huge. So we were on their peripheral vision. So press and reaching out to other people with large numbers, with good content that the content is what's missing. So make sure your content is what's missing and what's needed in alignment with what's mainstream. I hope that made sense. And no, those no, are I'm the not. networks that are gonna survive too. So how did you get that Forbes write up? <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I, I share a lot on social media on what I'm doing and I'm not afraid to ask. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna say, look, this is what I'm doing, will you mind writing up about us? And I reached out to them and I asked. I have no problem with asking for the sale, I have no problem with asking for the write-up, ask. And if you get no, keep asking, because somebody is gonna say yes. Don't be afraid of the no. Um, that's amazing. I, uh, I have been in digital a very long time and I, just to go back to the, the, the glut, I remember, you know, when I first started doing scripted and I was in a, a, a couple of very prominent scripted things, everybody thought, oh, that's where it is. And then everyone jumped in and millions of dollars came in and then it just, the bubble burst <laughs> in a terrible way. And I don't think it's ever recovered as far as like the quality of digital content. And I see it kind of a little bit rising up again, but um, a lot of people got a lot of careers out of it and a lot of uh, different things got picked up. But can, I'm hmm? interrupting Felicia. Can we <laughs> talk about, but I'm, I just flashed on a memory. <laughs> when you said that, which kind of explains why you are Felicia Day, despite the fact that this is, you know, that you're, you, you're being asked to write other things, and that the fact that, you know, empires rise and fall, the new empire wants to work with you, right? And we worked together on a show called Supernatural a few years ago. She, and, yeah, um, I came out, you were. Wasn't she amazing Charlie's originator, thank and, you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was talking to the line producer who said, 
I, I said, how is Felicia doing? And by the way, we wrote the role and we were like, we'd like a Felicia Day type and we're lucky enough to get Felicia. Um, <laughs> And he said, she is fucking incredible. She just worked a whole day, and every time she went back to her trailer, she was working on a pilot. Like, she's writing a script at the same time. I mean, it isn't really a magic formula, and it doesn't really change with the times. I mean, it's good to be abreast of the new developments, but really the thing you have is grit and hard work. It's about so. work. Whenever I feel like, oh, I'm not getting ahead, oh, I'm just not working hard enough, and that's what I'm learning from each one of you. Like, you, it's just a lot of hard work, and you have to over, everybody has to overcome something. Um, I just want to ask one question because we're going to do a bunch of Q&A, you guys. So we're going to have a mic in the middle, and we'll do a big old chunk of Q&A. Uh, as a, I'm a new mom, and I have a baby, and I would love to hear from each of you what you wish you had been taught when you were younger that you could carry through this world. I mean, to me, when I, I've, I have a whole new worldview, worldview now, and I think that all the problems in the world stem from preschools going boys on their left and girls on the right. <laughs> And I don't know why, it just is like, oh, if we didn't do that, then we'd all just be able to hang out with all the weird hiccups. I, I miss my naive thing, but like, why teach that they're separate in the beginning, girls and boys? So I don't know. Is there something that you wish you knew as a child or a teenager or whatever that you would have carried through and would have helped your career? There is something that actually happened that, uh, that my dad taught me. And that's not only the world is your oyster, but if somebody else is doing a thing, you can probably do the thing. It's not a big mystery. If you want to learn to drive a truck, you can do that. I don't. I want to run a TV show. But um, it, it just it, it takes work. It takes smarts. It takes being willing to learn new things, making mistakes, putting good people around you. Don't be afraid to hire people that are better than you. It's, it's, it, it, surrounding yourself with knowledgeable people is just such an education. And that's been the biggest help for me since childhood is knowing that if I really, really want to do something, I mean, other than like Olympic swimming or something, I mean, you know, but something that, that I can actually do, um, you, you can do that. You can do that thing. Don't be your own worst enemy. Don't put hurdles in front of yourself. Well, I can't because it's like, no, no, why can't you? Why can't you? Answer that. Lauren? Oh, man. I'm sorry. Uh, We're going to go down the road, guys. OK? Uh, and I, uh, well, so you know, I have a five-month-old now. And uh, I, he's a little boy. And I think, in particular, a, a lot about how to raise a young man right now in this climate, because I don't like a lot of what I've been seeing and experiencing. And, um, and our, you know, to get political, our president's just the worst. Um, and so I think a lot about that and just about making sure that he feels okay to have feelings and emotions and uh, he doesn't have to be a certain type of thing. I, I just think across the board, we're gonna look at gender differently, I hope, moving forward in every avenue that just because a boy is a boy doesn't mean he will stay a boy even. Um, but for me, I think it's, uh, confidence, I mean, I, I think I've always been a confident person in a lot of ways, at the same time, there's always this nagging thing in the back of my head uh, of like second guessing. And I spent a lot of time the last couple of years trying to find my voice again, of not just a voice of being in a room of many people and working for one person and one type of show, but really who am I and who am I as a writer and what what do I want to put out there? And I think a younger version of me could be helped by, you know, the older version of me just lending a hand, being like, hey, it's okay. It's unique and weird, and you should embrace that shit. Monica? Um, I think, like I said earlier, when I first got a show running gig, I bought that, you know, nice girls don't get the corner office book. And um, two years later, we were fired, and we hadn't been nice. Um, so apparently that book lied. Um, <laughs> But I realized I love writing because I love humans. Humans are fucked up and weird and flawed and fascinating. And if I lead with kindness, my job is easier. I don't turn people down because I'm mean. I turn people down because that's a really great effort, but that's not what we're looking for. And I think that there's an honesty and a kindness that you can have as a boss that you're confident in your story and you're confident in your in the people you hire, but that you want what you want. It's not about being mean, it's not about being disrespectful, but also having a zero tolerance for assholes, frankly. I mean, it's enough. Yes. Mm -hmm. They get away with a lot, and they don't need to be in my life if I have any say over it. Yeah. Sarah? Uh, 
If I could tell younger me anything, yeah, okay, that's that's a better that's a rewrite of my question like, in a much better way. <laughs> is the, does that is it that going to be your question? Rewrite. I'm so it was a good I'm rewrite. enthralled with your no, answer, and I forgot so better. Um, I would tell her, like, never apologize for liking what you like. I spent a lot of my younger years thinking that what I had to do to be successful and frankly to be like accepted in the world was to make myself more like the people around me and to like what they like. And now I realize that m certainly my power as a storyteller comes from just, I don't know, I like it. I want to explore it. I want to take it apart and chop its head off and see what makes it tick, right? Um, I think the sooner that you can get in touch with that and stop questioning it and stop trying to justify it to anyone else, the sooner you're going to be in touch with your voice. Well, she switched up the question now. I mean, I don't, wait, don't sorry, sorry. Want. It's totally my fault, Amy. I'm you can go back. Asking. We'll just issue some uh, revised all right, pink so pages. On yours. That's uh, a good. Both of them are good questions. Just go with it. Uh, You're flowing, guys. I think. I think what I would tell a younger version of myself is to affect your experiences. Don't let your experiences affect you. Um, and and there's a way of doing that to where it's not about sort of building a thick skin that you don't let anybody in. There's just a realization that projects come and go. Projects come and go. Um, and I, I was reminded of, of this recently because I found something that I had written like a long time ago. It was like a notebook. I used to keep a no notebooks full of ideas of just weird, crazy thoughts, for, you know, going back to when I was in elementary school. Oh. And uh, I, you know, and I, and I saw a, a story in there that was basically Monsters, Inc. Like, Five years before Monsters mm -hmm. Inc. came out, you know, or meh, 10 years. Five years, five years. <laughs> five years before Monsters Inc. came out. Um, and, uh, and I was like, damn, like I was super creative. And, and the thing that you don't, you sometimes forget uh, in TV is your own voice, because part of your job is to mimic the voice of your boss. Um, and if you've been doing TV and if you've been grinding, like some of us have for so long, um, we just become professional mimics, and we become really good at writing in other people's voice, and you forget your own. Uh, so it was like, I, I decided after seeing that book that like, I'm gonna take two hours every week, and I'm just gonna brainstorm shit. I'm just gonna think about stuff. And so Sunday night, I like, I, uh, I you know, just went to a, a cafe and was like, I'm just gonna, if I could make anything right now, what would I make? And I came up with two ideas. I happened to have, have a meeting on Monday the next day, sold it in the room, sold one of them in the room. Came up with it on Sunday night. Um, so, but like, but I allowed myself that space that you just, you forget sometimes. Like that's why we all do this, right? We, we, we have a brain, we have an imagination and we need to explore it. Um, and, and you know, we, sometimes you just gotta pull, put aside the bullshit and just embrace that part of yourself. Gillian? Well, the, the note behind the note that I heard in your question <laughs> is that you're looking for parenting advice so that your, is it your daughter? Well, will grow up theoretical as advice. awesome as everyone here. I right? mean, yeah, but also it kind of, Sarah morphed it into a, a more succinct question it's about a, yeah. things that you wish you had known as a well, younger girl. I mean, for me, this is a chance to tell an awesome story about my awesome mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> Which is that when I was, uh, well, when I was a little kid, I wanted to grow up to write Hardy Boys books, which in a way is not that different from growing up to write TV shows. Mm -hmm. They were serialized and they were written by a bunch of different people, all with one name slapped on them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, then I thought I wanted to be a poet, which also has things in common with script writing, I am here to tell you, but I planned to grow up to be a professional poet, and my mother was like, oh, you'll never move out of my guest room. Um, not that she didn't think I could succeed as a poet, but success as a poet does not get you out of your mother's bedroom. Um, and then when I was watching TV and noticed the names of the writers going by and realized that's a job, right? Just like Willow said, if somebody does it, you can do it. And I said, oh, I've changed my mind. I want to write television. And my mother said, awesome, you can buy me a beach house. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm ashamed to say I have not done. Uh, but that automatic assumption that she made that I would be able to be a television writer was so valuable. 
the no, she didn't say, oh, that's very difficult, or I, you know, how would you even get started? She said, well, you're going to be rich. So <laughs> was just, that level of confidence in me, I, I feel like I really carried that into my first jobs and didn't worry about whether I could do it. Kimberly? I have two things that I want to share. Number one is magic is real. Believe in magic. And when I say magic is real, I mean that look at Disney. Look at what he's done. That's magic. And when you want to do something and when you want something that seems completely impossible to happen, you find people that are doing it. And that's when magic becomes possible. If the front door is locked and the back door is locked, start looking on the side windows, start <laughs> finding basement windows, hell, make a door. But magic is real. Number two is on your path as a kid growing up, relationships come and go. And I hear a lot of people say, and even my students years ago say, man, a part of me died when that happened. Uh, I need you to resurrect that part of you because you're still here on the planet. <laughs> Bring that part of you back alive. Don't die with situations, circumstances, and people and relationships. Wake up, wake that part of you up because that's where the magic is. A lot of people have probably died with the cure for cancer. So don't let your dreams die in you. Find it, it's there. There are people doing it. Make friends with them. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, we are going to do Q&A now. So if you'd like to, I believe, line up in the middle and ask some questions. Don't hit each other. Single file, please. We'll tr we have a big panel. We're not going to get to everybody. I'm just going to uh, crush some dreams right now. But <laughs> we're going to try. So first question. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Alexander. Um, I flew here from Miami to wow. see you guys because I'm tenacious in that way because I got to say this before I implode. You guys are trailblazing for women that are creatives and are trying to like do this. So, you know, Amazing. Been, <laughs> honestly, you guys are great. Um, I've been doing film. I'm a female director, writer, actress, all the hats because, as you know, you got to wear a million hats to do anything in the beginning. Um, and my everything you guys have been saying has been like, feeding back onto everything. I'm, I'm immigrant born, so I, everything, I also have a family of doctors, so it's like, oh, you wanna be creative. That's funny, why don't you, you know, make money? So I'm you know, always being forced in that direction, so thank you, first of all. Um, and secondly, how does someone that is kind of like, I live in Miami, so I'm like constantly in a very, very small box, how does someone have the courage to come out here and be like, hey, Sarah, Felicia, can, can I have a, you know, how do you, how do you knock on those doors to be like, I live for this, you know, I, I live to write, I have a horror script, I have a paranormal thing, that's my weird brain in action. So how does someone just be like, hi, mm, how do I introduce myself into that? I think she just you're doing it right now. Good. Like, yeah. I mean, you're doing you flew a good out job. From Miami. And I got a I, job. You're first up, you yeah. flew up. You put you put freaking flowers miles into the situation. No, anybody have any advice for her? The, the, I have advice on the follow up because this was a really good introduction, mm -hmm. and it's 2018 is a great time. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have YouTube, we have you. we have so many. Right, <laughs> that's the thing. Right, it's like. Having hopes and dreams is good. Having product is better, right? You've shot something. You probably have it up on YouTube or something. You can send us a link, right? We're in, now we're all interested in what you're making. So sending something to follow up so we can see what you're interested in. Short-ish is better. Yeah, short-ish. Short is better. I have they are all short films. Yeah. I'm also one of the only female uh, directors in Miami in that circle. So it's like, it's really hard. It's really difficult to do, to just, I'm, I'm, I've been show running or directing or producing a bunch of dudes to just listen to me and pay attention. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, we got to do this. And we, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, no, link everybody. I mean, every, you, there's Twitter handles for everybody. I don't have them, but I'm sure if you g Google everyone's name, you'll come up with social media, link stuff. I mean, when I was first starting out with web series, I would watch literally every single web series out there to find other people making scripted web series. And one of my very best friends who ran my company for five years was someone I picked up off the internet. <laughs> you know, so wow. like, 
Well, I mean, not like that. I talent pick them up. Oh. I'm a real talent whore. Anyway, uh, yeah, so definitely follow up because everybody on this panel wants to see your stuff. So good luck. Well, and, and, I, and the I audience, just, um, too. Like, do we have a yeah. hashtag? Yeah, so do, you, do, you have a, do you have some place you can direct people to find your um, work? The Muted Alpha on Twitter. I've got, I have also, I got here because I'm a YouTube creator. So um, Muted Alpha Behavior is my... my Awkward favorite. Behavior. Muted alphabet. Oh, okay. No, I That's don't, better. I don't live in LA, so uh, I can speak to that a little bit. I actually live in the middle of nowhere. I live in the middle. I'm 30 minutes west of Yosemite National Park. I have pine cones and bears for friends, okay? <laughs> it's, they, they pay, the pay is terrible. So uh, I can definitely say internet is the way to go. I mean, I've made every advancement in my career that I have made through the internet, and especially Facebook. Oh, I know. Found each other. But no, no, this is, that's, that's the way to do it. That's totally the way to do it. Make friends, make allies. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good luck. luck. Good luck. Hi. Hello. My name is Rebecca. Um, actually, I was really, really happy with that last question, Felicia, that you brought up because that's been something that's been bothering me for a really long time in terms of just working in this industry. Because um, I've, I've wanted a family for a really long time. I want a huge family, but it's also kind of that idea where you have to choose when you're working in this industry. Like, do you, do you pursue that or do you pursue your career? And like to Sarah's point, sometimes I forget, you know, like you have a vagina, like you're in a room full of people. Three, then, three, like, it's, three mentions. Yeah. Three. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you forget that sometimes, but then like, you know, like the dream is to be able to have like a kid in my belly and one on my back and running like a set as a director. But like, how do you, how do you deal like with, for all the working moms out there, um, how do you guys deal with the stress in terms of kind of having to play that persona in the corporate world, as well as also just kind of being yourself and owning up to like, you know, like to being a mom and a creator? I can speak to that because I have two dogs. Two dogs. She's a dog mom <laughs> to no. two. Re new baby. She's got a new baby in the house. Yeah. He's three months. He's a handful. Lauren, answer this question. <laughs> I also have two dogs <laughs> and a baby, and it's a disaster in my house. Um, I think I'm, I'm figuring that out. I think everyone's just, you just figure it out. And what I found when I was pregnant, and again, we had like a lot of female directors on our show. They all, like so many of them had children, and they were like, oh man, I have this story about when I was eight months pregnant, standing on set, and I was doing this or that, and I had no idea. And I don't know if they would have told me those stories had I not been a pregnant person being waddling around being like, guys, this is crazy. Um, but I think you just figure it out. And there is no, at least from my very limited experience, uh, there's no real plan that you can make. I mean, Monica has two kids and I worked with Monica. And so she was someone that was inspiring to me to be like, okay, because... She, she has a husband who works, and I have a husband who works, and I work with, in the past, I've worked with a lot of men who have wives who stay at home, and there's nothing wrong with that, but no one had really interacted with people with, you know, two people who work and have a family, and I think I'm going to be figuring that out my whole life, but you just do it, and you don't not do what you want. You know, you do everything that you want and see how it works. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's it. <laughs> you just do it. Yeah, I mean, no, seriously, you just do it. You have your kid, you have your job. I mean, my son has autism. That is a huge burden, as is my job, as is my other kid, as is my husband, as are my two dogs, who are the best thing in my life right now. Whoa, because, dog, you know, off, dog, off, I think we learned that two, two dogs is the key to success. It, it really is about <laughs> what we've, having I mean, dogs to away. love you when no one else does. Um, <laughs> But I think you just make time and your life is, and you'll be stressed and you'll be exhausted and you'll sleep when your head hits the pillow and then you wake up and you do it all and you try and not, my attitude is do no harm. If I, if I end the day doing no harm to my children <laughs> or my dogs or my husband or the job, killed it. Um, but that's kind of, I mean, it's just, it is. And I feel like it's funny because it was never, my mom, who was in a terrible marriage with my dad, always would say, and this is what happens if you can't support yourself, like in my head. So there was never a question in my mind that I was gonna support myself, and when I had kids, 
There was never a question in my husband's mind that he was gonna, like, we all were gonna work. That's just the truth of it. Now, does it mean I've missed plays? Yeah. But I've seen a bunch of them too. So like, <laughs> and I've, uh, you know, like it's just like you just balance like everything else and then you're exhausted and then we're mortal. So it'll end eventually. <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> wow. That went dark. <laughs> I mean, in a happy way. Wow. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I, you know, in my 18 months of experience, I would say that um, you're never going to be able to do everything the way you think you want to do it, but that's okay. And a lot of stuff goes the wayside. You know, I used to do a lot of things like play seven hours of Fallout, and it was great. I would love <laughs> to play seven hours of Fallout ever again. It'll never happen. It might, I don't know. I'll be 13. Uh, she'll be 13 and I'll do it. But um, you let go of things that aren't, and your, pri your life is prioritized a lot better. So I would, you know, don't let life pass you by because you're afraid of what other people will do. Just, you just literally just bust the wall down yourself if they put up the wall. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Hi, um, so my question uh, is primarily about, you guys talked about um, passion and following trends. Uh, I'm a horror writer and I'm kind of exploring ideas to write a episodic supernatural TV show, but one of the recent trends is that episodic isn't really hot anymore. It's kind of seen a bit more tacky nowadays and a lot of TV shows such as The X-Files, which used to be heavily episodic, is now switching really to you know serialized. So, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, um, going between your passion and following the trend, and specifically if it's advisable anymore to even write episodic, or is it something that people just pass on nowadays? You mean episodic versus serialized content, yeah, right? Correct. I mean, I think if you have an idea that's um, episodic, network wants episodic. They do. There's, there's still an avenue for episodic. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of other markets, but I mean, I do think episodic is still a legitimate form, and I think most networks really want that. Yeah. I mean, there's a kind of bread and butter to a story that begins and ends in the same hour, and I think that that's always sort of the holy grail. How do you find the episodic that doesn't feel repetitive, that can rerun through time and memoriam. I also think if you're passionate about it, write it. Because yeah. who knows what's trendy. I think, you know, for all those of us who have agents and stuff, they're always like, this is the thing that's new. And like, I think early on in my career, at least, I wanted to listen to that because mm -hmm. I thought they knew what they were talking about. <laughs> now yeah. I've realized no. they don't. Remember but nouns? Were, <laughs> yes. Nouns were popular. I was told when pronouns you... were popular. <laughs> to think of a show with a pronoun. Yeah. It's very weird. Um, <laughs> but. But I think now, especially because there are these quirky avenues, there's so much content, like just write the thing that you're passionate about. And, and I think kind of don't worry about, is it gonna sell? What's it gonna do so much? Because I do think we are in a landscape that's really exciting right now where you can do that. And if you're trying to write to what someone is telling you is popular, I doubt it's gonna be as successful. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. We're gonna thank try you. to speed through just to get everybody in line. Um, not speed, but just go accelerated <coughs> from before. Hi. Hi. You get two mics. Nope, you don't <coughs> get that one. Just one. Goodbye. No, you don't need to hear my voice. Nice dress. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name's Ashley Ryan. I'm a recent graduate from the MFA program at Loyola America. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so my question actually hinders on the Me Too movement. I've been in um, a few rooms um, and I have been lucky enough not to experience sexual harassment, but I do know that it happens in the room. And could you share how you handle that? Wow. <laughs> As a showrunner, how uh, I handle it uh, is that we talk about it at the beginning of each season. Now, I don't probably look like someone who's looking to bad touch girls in a writer's room, because I'm not. We're boys, right? Um, but uh, one thing that the Me Too movement has taught me, because in the last, I don't know, it's been like 18 months or something, so much stuff about television has been in the news, and specifically about bad behavior in writer's rooms. And so even though at the beginning of every season, legal sends somebody to talk to us and talk to production, I and the other executive producers on both of the shows that I was working on, we just started making phone calls and calling people into our offices and we talked to every single department head, we talked to everyone on staff, we talked to everyone in post, and we said, we just wanna reiterate that if something feels weird, we want you to tell us. It would be our worst fear that something would happen and people would be afraid to escalate it up to the executive producers. And funny thing that happened is because we said that again, a few people came to us. 
and a, lo and a lot of it was questions, like, does this rise to the level of like, what they're talking about when they say harassment? And sometimes the answer was yes, and sometimes the answer was no. But we can't do anything if we don't know about it. I think probably all the people who are in, in a position of power live in terror that people that are working for them would be mistreated. And so really, it's about making sure everyone understands that the channels are open and there's no penalty. In fact, we appreciate it if people talk to us. So that's my answer just from the position of someone who's trying to, to keep it professional in the workplace. <laughs> I think you're, if you're the person that it's happening to, um, I think the key is, is finding an ally. Because um, in every room, there will be one. There will always be an ally. And um, it's pretty obvious who those people are. Um, and, and, and just sort of like, and talk it out. And, and, and make sure um, that when you do go to your boss, you're in a, a protected position as opposed to a vulnerable position. Um, because someone else already has your back. And if you, if you uh, God, it sucks that like people don't just believe you right off the bat. But uh, I mean, one of the keys is when you have this ally, um, you, you know, they're now looking out for it. And if they see it, then you got two people. You got two people who's got, you know, you've got your word and you got theirs. Um, and then you have a case. Um, and it's always, it's always really important to find, find that person you trust uh, and bring them into your, your circle when something's happening to you. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Hi. Hi. Whoa. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My name is Arshad. Uh, I'm an aspiring TV writer. Um, thank you all for being here. It's so inspiring just to hear all of you speak. And thank you for the magic quote, because sometimes as a minority creator, you forget about the magic, and it's there. You just have to remember it. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Um, my question for all of you, or whoever, uh, <laughs> as a showrunner, and you guys are talking about making decisions, what is one of the most difficult decisions that you had to make, and is anything still haunting you? Uh, oh. I, I am haunted by a red flag that I ignored, right? A situation that I could have gotten out of, not a harassment type of thing, like a professional situation where like, there were enough signs that it wasn't going well, but I talked myself into, oh, it'll work out, it'll be fine and I made everyone's life harder for the entirety of that season by not kind of getting rid of the person, yeah. people who were not right for that yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not trying to like that, you know, there nothing, it's just a bad fit. Like we're not trying to say like, oh, there was an evil person involved here and we were stuck with them, <laughs> but just I, that, to put a positive spin on something that really is a problem and not recognize, you know what? Sometimes Just there's a bad on. apple. Like, yeah. you know, you made a bad decision and instead of trying to keep fixing it and putting spackle over it, just say, sorry, you're not part of this anymore. Goodbye. No, that's Here's your severance check. That's a great, I mean, I have had that in the past too. It's like every set or every business is, it's a living organism. And you think, oh, I can fix it. I want to make everybody happy all the time. But you know what? both of you would be better doing your own, not in the situation, because it's just not a good, it's like putting chocolate in gumbo. Is that a good thing? No, it's not. <laughs> Put a chocolate in a souffle. I don't know. That was a, I need to, anybody else? <laughs> I also think that's for you too. I remember like thinking, oh, I could just please this person. I could just please this person. I could just please this person. And at a certain point you're like, you don't like my writing. Like, I mean, let's just be like, and I feel like some, if there's something that haunts me, it's not leaving a situation that I knew wasn't working 100%. and waiting to be kicked out as opposed to just leaving. Because I think there's also, you see it when it's not gonna work. And there's some, this business is so subjective that sometimes it's not even about your writing or their writing, it's just not a great fit. You have different worldviews, you write different kinds of characters and having the sort of confidence in your own voice to say this isn't a good fit and I'm gonna leave. Sometimes that is a more powerful situation. That though. goes for crew too. Um, I do a lot of things, I wear a lot of hats and uh, I'm on set a lot with my own stuff. And sometimes it's not a good fit for me on someone else's set 
And I realized, well, maybe this is going to be a shit show, and maybe I should just kind of go. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's good. it turns out to be a good decision, because then I hear things later. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I got out before that happened. <laughs> so um, I, I, I guess that was my point. And when you're starting out, this can be tougher. I mean, because it boils down to actually being willing to turn down something. And I know that when you're looking for your first job, you don't care if it fits your aesthetic, you don't care if some of the people are assholes, it's all fine because you wanna get in that door. And honestly, on your first job, you probably just do. Yep. But as your career progresses, being able to recognize this is not for me and I'm gonna have another option, yeah. is, that's a good skill to develop. The greatest success is reaching a point where you can say no. I mean, it really is the greatest that. success. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, last two questions. We're going to get through, you guys. Hi. Hi. Hello. Uh, Hi, Peyton. Hi. <laughs> um, my question is, do you have any tips for procrastination? <laughs> oh, I have to get back no to No reason. No, no. Deadline. Accept all invitations to appear on panels. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing writing buddies. I, I when, because right now I am uh, developing way too much at one time, um, and I am not very good at sort of setting my own internal deadlines. Um, and so I, I, you know, I reach out to people who I know who are in a, a similar situation, and I say, hey, uh, I'm going to be at this place at this time. Uh, you're going to show up, right, and make sure I write. Um, but we write together, and, and it's sort of like it forces you out of the house, too, um, and writing at home with two adorable dogs is really hard. Um, but, but I think it's, it's really about sort of setting a, a schedule for yourself, um, because you can't just wake up and, like, I'm going to write today. You really need to sort of, like, put it down in, on a piece of paper of, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this many pages, or I'm going to spend this many hours, um, and then I'm going to take a break, and then I'm going to also spend this many hours. Um, yeah, I mean, those are all good questions. I mean, there's no, there's, I think, you know, I think the important thing is procrastination is, has a root in something and you're probably afraid. You're either afraid of failing hey. or you're afraid or you're just spread too thin or you just have too cute dog. I don't know. Writing is hard. It's hard. That's it is the other so thing. hard. Like you're not imagining it. You're stuck a lot of the time. That's what writing feels like. It feels kind of shitty some of the time. Sometimes you're like, I'm a genius, but most of the time it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> Accepting the nature of what you're doing is helpful for me. Accepting like, oh, of course I don't want to do this today. I want to do something where I feel like a genius and that's not going to be writing these pages, right? But once you kind of admit that truth, at least for me, once I admit that truth to myself, it's a little easier. And also don't worry about the first draft. Like don't, don't focus so much on everything being right in the first draft. You got to let that go. Just accept that it's going to be crap and you'll come back and you'll fix it later. But, but get crap. it down on paper. <laughs> and Make out. crap. There you go. <laughs> there. All right, thank this, this you. This is a takeaway from me. Last yeah. question. I'm sorry. Oh, You're fine. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah, really okay. Oh. Hi. I'm short too. Hi, everybody. You're awesome. Love you all. Um, so I grew up watching Star Trek Next Gen, and that was a show that pushed boundaries. Now, with this paradigm shift that we're going through right now, where is the line? Like we were talking about earlier, uh, it was mostly white men trying to write roles for people that weren't white men. Scarlett Johansson is a great example of what's kind of happening right now. Like, where is that line? I want to write things that I'm a white dude, but I would like to write things that are not about my problems because there's other problems than mine. So where is that line that's drawn to where I'm an artist and I want to push boundaries or I'm a racist, gay-hating man that hates the world. Like, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that's pushing boundaries, not the one that's, oh, you're not supposed to be that character. You know what I mean? You may, I, do, was, do, I mean, don't be that guy. Well, I don't want to. Well, that's that's I, my point, is where is the line but from I think, being an artist and being that guy? Well, I mean, I think, to mention ScarJo, um, I also feel like, there are a lot of trans guys not getting work. Sure. So it's really hard when the trans community doesn't get work to be like, oh, let's open it up. Because suddenly only one group gets to be opened up. It's not as, if, as though you know, it's an open playing field either. Right. Um, so I feel like 
it's a complicated situation because I agree. I, like, I write white people, I write older people and younger people and wizards and all sorts of people. <laughs> um, but I also ask questions and I also observe. And one of the things that was always interesting to me, like on my first job, um, I just decided, and I'm not going to mention names, but I decided very early on I wasn't going to write any people of color on the show because my boss would rewrite it. Um, and suddenly I'm like jive talking people in my like scripts with my name on it. I'm like, what's happening? What's happening? I can't do this. And so, but what was interesting is I'd say, but that doesn't sound like anyone I know. And he's like, no, 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 this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, there was no openness. I mean, it wasn't about being an artist. It was not being open to representing a different experience. So I would ask you when you want to push those boundaries, also do research yes. and ask and really open yourself up because we're all coming at different parts. And yes. I feel like as a writer, that's your job is sort of what is someone feeling? And if that's not familiar, well, talk to people who can help you famili familiarize yourself with what their plight is. Right. Thank you, that was amazing. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Very. You snuck in. You snuck in. I did. I would love to know what are you guys watching right now that you feel like Killing Eve. Killing Eve is so good. <laughs> that was oh the my question God, I was gonna end with, so okay, oh, you're psychic. Oh, what ever let's look another there. Yeah. Killing the Eve. Handmaid's tale. I am so hooked. Oh. Oh. It's coming on tonight on Hulu. Killian? 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 Uh, I just discovered Britannia on Amazon. What? <laughs> what is? Last night. Uh, oh I my God! So that's well, on my to do list. In yeah. The air. yeah. So that's. Ooh. Yeah. Hey, do I get two? Do I get two? Okay. End, of, end of the fucking world is also fantastic. Okay. Okay. Uh, yep. Yep. Fair. I was recently made aware that a new season of the Great British Baking Show has been made available. Oh, it's really good. <laughs> it's really good. It's, it's really, really good. good. It's yeah. really good. They did meringues. Okay. Hi. Chewing gum on Netflix. Two oh, seasons. Oh yeah. I mean, I'll jump on the Handmaid's bandwagon, but also throwing out there, really like Anne with an E. Uh, it's super Aww. smartly written. And Babylon Berlin. Mm. Oh, so interesting. Worth checking out. I'm super boring. I've been catching up with old Supernatural that I never got to see the first time. <laughs> it's a good show. That's wrong. That was yeah, I've heard it's a good right. show. Yeah. Thumbs up, season six, season, seven. Yeah, one, three, seven. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. My personal favorite. I'm in five <laughs> really right good. now. Um, okay, well, thank you guys. I'd like to say a shout out to Walton Dornish hey, right here. Yes, thank you. Yeah. This uh, panel. Best. There is actually going to be another female showrunners panel here in the YouTube space in September, and there also is going to be a female directors panel. Uh, look for those announcements. It's an awesome initiative. I'm so happy to be here and be on the stage with amazing, inspiring women. You guys make me want to go create things, so thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, YouTube.